What is up my dudes and welcome to chapter 5 Ethernet. So this week we're going to be covering, you know, just Ethernet in general, um, hexadecimal and a couple other things. So here are all the topics, blah, 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 blah. And now Ethernet protocol. So Ethernet is your is obviously the common standard now. Most networks are all connected through Ethernet. Um, chances are your PC has an Ethernet cable that goes from the, the, your PC into a, a cable modem or a switch or something like that. So Ethernet is defined in the 802.2 and 802.3 standards. 802.3, I'm sorry, 802.2, duh, covers the data link layer, and 802.3 is Ethernet in general. So if they ever ask you, you know, which which IEEE standard covers Ethernet, it's 802.3. So Ethernet comes in all kinds of cable types. Remember we talked about category 3, 5, and 6. Uh, 3 being 10 megabits per second, cat category 5 being 100 megabits per second, and category 6 being 100 or 1,000 megabits per second. Um, there are also other standards that go all the way up to 40 gigabits per second and even 100 gigs per second according to this chart. All right, so Ethernet, uh, as a standard, operates at, at the, the bottom two layers, one and two, the data link and the physical layers. And don't forget the data link layer is actually separated into two sub-layers, the LLC, logical link control, and then the MAC sub-layer. All right, and I've always remembered it as um, uh, the LLC kind of deals with uh, software and the MAC is more deals with hardware. Um, but according to the slide, they say, you know, the LLC handles communication between the upper layers and the lower layers. Uh, and then obviously the Mac layer is, is more concerned about the hardware. Um, and this is where you like your Mac address comes from. Don't worry too much about this. Obviously, you need to know this stuff for the exam. But nowhere like in the field have I ever needed to know, hey, the data link layer is separated into two separate sub layers, the LLC and the Mac. You know, I just need to know at layer two, um, I assign Mac addresses. And that's where the ARP protocol um, kind of kicks in at. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. All right, the MAC sublayer, um, its primary responsibility is uh, data encapsulation, slapping that MAC address on there, um, and media access control. And then data encapsulation provides, like, the decides how the frame is going to be sized or delimited, um, the addressing on the frame at layer two, um, and some kind of error detection. Remember how we talked about each frame has something that signals the start and something that signals the end. So we have a preamble that kind of signals the start of the frame. Um, then we have some addressing information. Then we have the data. And then usually at the back, we have some kind of error correction mechanism or error detection to see if that packet got modified in transit or if it lost some information. And then there's something to signal this is the end of the packet. So Ethernet has been around for a long time. Um, there are some buildings where even the phone systems, like the, the, the regular wired phones, um, are actually wired with a Category 3 cable. Um, so way back in 1973 is kind of where it started. Um, 10 megabits per second, Cat 3. All right, then here's that frame we talked about. So we have a preamble, which kind of signals the start of the frame. Then we have our addressing, um, a type. Uh, then we have our data. And then we have a frame check sequence that looks for errors. And you know, think about the frame check sequence um, as something like this. You know, let's say the, 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 all the number ones in this packet um, total, you know, 215. So the frame check sequence would say 215. So then when the packet got there, if it didn't have that many number ones in there, it would know that something happened to that packet. Because remember, at the end, once stuff is sent on the line, it all gets down boiled to ones and zeros. All right, and then two very important things is to remember, the minimum frame size is 64 bytes. The maximum frame size is 1,518. Although most computers are set for 1,500, that way if it's a little bit over, um, everything still works. So anything under 64 bytes is considered a runt and is dropped, and anything over 15 uh, or 1,518 is considered a giant and gets dropped. So there are some little TCP IP optimizers that you'll download from different sites. And what they do is they change your um, TCP size from 1500 to 1518, which obviously allows you to put a little bit more data in each frame. So theoretically, that would be faster. But every once in a while, it goes a byte or two over. And if you're already set the maximum, and then all of a sudden a frame is generated, and the addressing information kind of gets on there, and it's too big, and now it's, it's 1519, that frame would get dropped. Um, and it would have to ask it to resend it again and all kinds of issues. So never use those little crappy TCP IP optimizer things. Uh, they never really work. They just cause you more trouble than they're worth. All right, and then using Wireshark. 
All right, we're not going to cover that um, in this class. Eventually, when I'm done with these four Cisco classes, um, we'll talk about using Wireshark. But if you've never played with it, Wireshark kind of shows you all the different packets that hit your NIC card. Um, and it groups them by protocol and IP address. And there, it's very useful for finding very detailed, specific information um, or if you're troubleshooting. Like, let's say you're doing DHCP and you're trying to figure out why it's not working. Um, you know, you can actually see, like, which packets are getting there and obviously which ones we're waiting on. So it's a very useful tool. All right, moving on. So now MAC addresses um, are in hexadecimal format. And not only hexadecimal, but IP version 6 that we'll eventually talk about uh, in, like, chapter 7 or 8 um, is also in hexadecimal. So you really need to understand hexadecimal. And the way the hexadecimal system works is it's a base 16 system, meaning it's numbered 0 through 15. And if you add that, so obviously you add the 0 and then the 15, you get 16 total numbers. So there are 16 physical digits or characters in hexadecimal. Now, sometimes when you see a number, like you'll see this 0x in front of it. So this 0x signifies that whatever's next is going to be um, hexadecimal. Sometimes you see a little h or something like that. Um, there are all kinds of little ca uh, calculators out there to kind of convert this for you. Even your Windows calculator, I think, might be able to do this for you. But it's actually very easy, and you do need to know how to do this on your own. So that said, so hexadecimal is 0 through 9, and then there's, so there are no double-digit numbers. Instead of having 10, which would be two digits, they add A, B, C, D, E, and F. So F is 15. That's the highest you can go. So a MAC address of all Fs would be a broadcast. And we'll talk about broadcasts um, and how like they're always at the end of the, the line um, a little bit later. But that's how it works. So it's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, then 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, A, B, C, D, E, F. F is the highest number. All right. Each hex character is 4 bits, and 4 bits is called a nibble. And they're usually paired to produce a byte. So if I go back to this slide, you'll see that they're paired 7 and 3. All right, now let's talk about um, how you would decode like the seven and three um, into binary. So to figure out a hex digit, like what its binary value is, you, you create a number line, you start at one, and then you double it three times to the left. So two times one is two, two times two is four, two times four is eight, and that's simple. And then you just simply put, I'm gonna grab this and that. All right, so let's say the binary number was seven. So we're talking about four, five six seven so this would have to be zero up oh, zero what is, oh i did that one i need to do the pencil sorry folks all right so and this would be a big zero so zero one 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 in binary would be seven in hex so you can see a hex digit um, can be anything from zero all the way to 15. so there are 16 total combinations all right, but what happens when you get numbers? Um, like, let's say uh, uh, CD. How do you do CD? Well, we know A is 10, 11, 12, so C is 12. So which of these numbers add up to 12? Well, 8 and 4. Then the rest have to be 0. So that would be C. And then, so A, B, C, D. So D is 10, 11, 12, 13. So which of these numbers add up to 13? Well, 8, 4, and 1. So this is 0. So 1101 1, 1 would be D. So now you've kind of figured out hex, and you see how easy it is. You're like, oh, well, that's, that's really nothing. So make sure you're, you're good with this. Um, give yourself a two random numbers, um, and then do the binary. So remember, a binary digit is 8 bits or a byte. So there's one bit, which is just a bit, and it's a 1 or a 0. Then there are four bits, and we call that a nibble, and that's what hexadecimal uses. And then there are eight bits, which is a byte, um, and that's what IP version 4 uses. So let's say I've got 7B. So this is going to be 7, this is going to be B. So let me grab that pencil again. So we're going to do 7 here, and we're going to do B here. So which of these numbers add up to 7? So 4, 5, 6, 7. And then B is 11, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 7B in binary would be 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Pretty easy, huh? All right, now let's do it the other way. 
let's say I've got um, 1, 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 0, 0. What would this be in hex? Remember, hex is all 0, x, and then the next two numbers. So here we got 4, 5, 6, so this would be 6. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, so 12, 10, 11, 12. So 6c would be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 in binary. Make sense? All right, make sure you practice that. You've got to have a grip on hexadecimal, which, again, at this point is really the easiest math you're going to get in this class because this is going to rear its ugly head again in Chapter 7 and 8 when we start talking about IP version 6. All right, so a MAC address is 12 digits in hexadecimal, or 12 characters of hexadecimal. Each character in hexadecimal is 4 bits, so there are 48 total bits in a MAC address. So let me show you what a MAC address looks like on my PC. I got ahead of myself there, so it's IP config slash all forward slash all. IP config just shows you like your addressing it, your IP, your level, your layer three addressing. If I do all, I'll get all of it. And it shows you for each adapter, and I also have like VMware installed here, so I'll have a bunch of adapters. So here's my stuff. So here's my IP address, 192.168.11.1, my subnet mask, and then here under physical address, you see my MAC address. Now, the MAC address is split up. Um, it's, gonna, it's 12 characters, all hexadecimal, but each character is 4 bits. So 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 comes out to be 48. All right, and the first six digits, you know, the 005056, is assigned to the manufacturer. So if you want to start a business and you want to sell NIC cards, you have to register with like the Internet Association or one of the associations, maybe IEEE, and they will give you your first six digits. And then every uh, NIC card that you make has to have those six digits on there. Then you use the other six digits um, as serial numbers or whatever for the cards. And that way you can track that stuff. So let me give an example. So some guy um, wants to hack like a hospital system or something, and he goes to McDonald's where it's free Wi-Fi, and he orders himself a frappe, and he sits down with his crappy Dell laptop, because uh, he's crappy, and he does some kind of hack. Well, we can trace the IP address of the hack all the way to the McDonald's, and we know the time and we know the place. So now we know, you know, like Sunday at noon, um, somebody hacked us from McDonald's. Well, all those places with free Wi-Fi typically have some kind of camera system um, in the ceiling that, that's kind of taking Fairway's picture. So when they go to McDonald's, they find out you know who was who was connected at that time, where they went, things like that, because that's all stored on your router. And then they find, hey, here's the MAC address that was used. Well, then they say, well, this MAC address you know belongs to a Dell. So then they start looking at the camera footage and look to see who had a Dell. And then, hey, here's this guy who ordered a frappe on his credit card, and he's got a Dell laptop. So chances are that's probably the guy. So the more of the story is, um, if you're going to do something stupid, make sure you don't use your credit card. So I digress. So remember, the first six digits of your MAC address are what they call the, the OUI, the Organizational Unique Identifier. And then the vendor assigns the last part. So first 24 bits of a MAC address um, are the OUI, and the second 24 are the vendor signs, typically like for a, a serial number. All right, don't forget the size. A MAC address is 48 bits, and it's made up of 12 nibbles. All right, next slide. So they talk about the MAC address is often referred to as the burned-in address, and meaning that that IP, that MAC address is actually encoded into the ROM chip permanently. You know, your PC is very easily to go through software and change your IP address, but you can't really change your MAC address um, like that. Now, there are programs that let you spoof your MAC address, um, especially if you're running Linux, because there's a lot of cool hacking tools in Linux. Um, so you can always spoof your MAC address, um, but it's physically burned in your chip. There's really no way unless you pop new ROM chips into your uh, card. But nowadays, like, the ROM chips are soldered in, um, and your NIC card is kind of par part of your motherboard. You know, we don't really use, like, um, PCMCIA cards anymore um, for, uh, or uh, PCI cards as NIC cards. We don't, you know, we don't really use ex expansion cards as NIC cards anymore. All right, so again, the kind of they show you, hey, go through ipconfig slash all to find your information. Um, uh, if you're using Mac or Linux, it's ifconfig because they always have to be different. 
Now you'll see MAC or MAC addresses uh, represent different ways. Um, typically, sometimes we use a dash in between every two characters. Sometimes we use a colon, uh, and sometimes they do four characters in a period, four characters in a period. But there's always those 12 digits or 12 characters in a MAC address. All right, then they talk about a unicast address. So remember, what is unicast? Who remembers that? Good. So a unicast is one to one. So when I send a unicast, I'm sending something from me to, in this case, the server. Um, I have my specific MAC address, uh, and then I have the MAC address, you know, of the server that I'm trying to send to. Then I have my IP address and the destination or the IP address of the server. So my there's always a source destination MAC address, source destination IP address, source destination port number. Because any time you're trying to get somewhere, you have to have the starting point and the ending point uh, in order to get from one location to another. And each piece of hardware might use a different piece of information, so all that information has to be on there. All right, if you don't know where the destination is, what we do is we tend to, we tend to send a broadcast out, and a broadcast is one to all. So a broadcast of all Fs in the MAC address would be a broadcast. And if you use Wireshark, you'll see these sometimes uh, where the, the destination uh, MAC address is, is all Fs. And that's somebody looking for something. And we typically use those in like DHCP when we're looking for an IP address. So when your PC first starts up, it doesn't have an IP address. So he has to, to send out a broadcast and say, hey, anybody out there can give me an IP address? And then luckily the DHCP server would respond and say, yeah, here you go. All right, and lastly, there's multicast addresses, and multicast is one to many. And I might send something, um, you know, on 224, you know, 00254, something like that. So, like, if you, I'm doing net meeting, you know, I may only invite certain people to the, to the net meeting. Um, so those people would all join my multicast group and hit that server, and we're all set. But there's a whole range of IP in IP version 4, 224000 to 239.255.255.255. And that's the class D range, and that's actually reserved just for multicast applications. If you're in IP version 6, um, you use FF00 double colon forward slash 8, and that's the Mac. So make sure you're good with those addresses and you have those in your notes. All right, next up we're going to talk about switches. So a switch is a layer two device and it makes all of its information based on layer two. So when a switch first starts up, it, ha it has what they call a MAC address table. So basically it has a piece of memory that's called the CAM, Content Addressable Memory, and the CAM is empty and it's waiting to learn MAC addresses so it knows where to send. So let's say in this case, um, PCA is gonna, like this, the switch just turned on, all everything just turned on, PCA is gonna send something to D. So what happens when A sends something to D the first time, the receiving address, so the address of A, is actually recorded in the CAM, and the CAM says, okay, hey, port 1 is now this MAC address, and I know because it's coming from him, and he told me that's his source. And then it's, it's spammed out ports 2, 3, and 4, because he doesn't know where PCD is. So PC2, 3, and 4 all get that information, and then D's response is, oh, hey, that's for me, and then he sends back something, and then that records the address for 4. So we record the IP address, or the MAC address, I'm sorry. We record the MAC address in the MAC address table from the sending PC, and that way we know it's firsthand. And then you get this table built up where it says port 1 is this MAC address, port 2 is this MAC address, uh, and then at that point, all the switch does is look for the MAC address. If, some, if a packet comes in, it checks the MAC address, the destination MAC address. If that's located in the table, it then sends it out that specific port. So once these two communicate the first time, then anytime A sent D a packet, it would just come into port 1 and it would go out port 4 and not ports 2 and 3. Now a hub, which is terrible, um, whatever comes in one port goes out all other ports except for the sending port. So anytime A would talk at all, it would be spammed out 2, 3, and 4. So that's why hubs are bad, because they send out so much traffic that you don't need. And remember, we talked about carrier sense, multiple access with collision detection. Well, carrier sense means I check the line to see if it's clear. If I'm getting broadcast, or if I'm getting all the traffic from 1, 3, and 4 on 2, 2 is almost never going to be clear, so he's going to have a hard time sending. So that's why hubs are really bad. If you have any hubs in your network, they should be removed. So the switch in the, doesn't care what the IP address is. It only looks at the destination MAC address. And it only records MAC addresses that are from the source. So the source MAC addresses are recorded in the CAM or the content addressable memory or the MAC address table. 
and the destination address is not because when A sends on port 1, I know that he's PCA and his source MAC, he's telling me his source address is this. So I can record that, but I have no idea where his destination is, so that's why that doesn't get recorded until PCD responds back. All right, so then they walk you through the example. So PCA sent something. So remember, all this equipment just first turned on. Um, the, the cam is totally blank. There's no MAC addresses that's learned. And A sends something. Well, then it comes out ports 2, 3, and 4 because it doesn't know where the destination is. And then when D sends back, it records that MAC address, and now those two can, can communicate just through their specific ports and not send any traffic to 2 and 3. And this is another reason why broadcasts are so bad. You know, if, if for some reason your PCs are broadcasting or you have a printer that's broadcasting or a NIC card that's freaking out and it's just sending a bunch of broadcasts out, it floods the network because anytime a broadcast hits a switch, the switch has no idea what port that is, so it sends it out all other ports. So if something comes in on a 48 port switch on port one that's a broadcast, it's sent out on all 47 other ports except for the port it was received. So, broadcasts, bad. Don't do them. All right, and this, is, this slide obviously refers to a, a small video that's on the, the Academy website. So basically it just shows you that, you know, um, when something comes into the switch, that's when I, I learn its MAC address, not to the destination port. And they kind of continue that. All right, then they talk about one of the packet tracers this week. All right, now frame forwarding. So switches have two different methods to forward packets back and forth. The first one is cut through, and what, what happens at cut through, as the packet is entering the switch, the switch looks for that destination MAC address. And as soon as that whole destination MAC address comes in, the switch is already making a decision based on that destination. Do I have it in my table? If I do, I send it out that specific port. If I don't have it in my table, I send it out all other ports except for the one it was received on. And that's cut through. The problem with that is it's very fast, but if you're if the frame is damaged for some reason, you're sending out damaged frames, and you're gonna have to resend those, and, and it's just gonna cause some issues. Now, the way Cisco use, they call what they call store and forward. They wait for the entire frame to come in, and then we go to the error detection mechanism, which is the cycle redundancy checker, the CRC, and we look at that to make sure that that, that frame has not been uh, you know tampered with, it's not been corrupted, that stuff like that. If the frame is good, then I forward it. So that's the Cisco method, store and forward. Wait for the whole frame to come in, make sure the frame is intact and not damaged, then make a decision, send it out. So cut through. As soon as a little bit of it comes in, I'm already making a decision, and the rest of that frame might be damaged, and, and I'm still sending it out anyway. All right, there are also different memory types that you can do on switches. Um, you can get port-based memory, where each port is dedicated to a certain amount of memory. And if I, if I get a whole bunch of traffic on two ports, then you can't really borrow memory from the other port. So it, that's not really kind of used a whole lot anymore, um, except for maybe low-end switches, I guess. Then there's shared memory, and this is all, all ports share the same amount of memory. And that way, if two ports are getting hammered, more, more, they can allocate more memory to those ports. All right, then they talk about um, duplex settings. Remember, full duplex is like a phone call. I can send and receive both directions, um, so we don't really have collisions in full duplex. Then there's half duplex, where I do have collisions, because I can only send or receive at the same time, like once at one at a time. So it's kind of like a walkie-talkie. Now, a duplex mismatch happens, like when your PC is set for full duplex, and for some reason the switch port's set for half duplex, or vice versa. So whenever you plug your PC into a switch, the Cisco switches by default try to negotiate full duplex. But if for some reason that negotiation fails, that port drops down to half duplex. And that's why when we set up ports on a switch, we should always manually configure them so we don't use automatic settings because like Jeremy says, you auto not use auto settings. All right, sometimes you'll see a switch, uh, a really old switch, and it'll have an MDIX button on there, and that stands for Media Independent Interface Crossover. In the old days, when you went switch to switch, you had to use a crossover cable because they were kind of hardwired, but there was one or two ports or something like that where there was like a little button and you could press in, and it would kind of go between straight through and uh, crossover. So here's a picture of one. So this port here, this 1X, so just this port here, 
if I leave it out, you can see like it'll be straight through so the, everything's straight. If I press it in, then the, the lines get crossed. So this is what a, um, an MDIX port looks like. So nowadays you shouldn't have to see anything like that um, because the ports are auto-sensing. But on the CCNA, anytime you're going from switch to switch, they expect you to write down crossover cable. Even though in today's world, a straight through cable will work between two switches, they still expect you to put crossover cable down for any question that says what kind of cable goes from switch to switch. All right, and finally, um, this chapter talks about ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. So ARP is a protocol that kind of tracks um, the MAC address to the IP address um, of different people you've, you've contacted or talked to. So let me kind of show you an example. So here's my PC. So if I do ARP, did I spell that right? ARP, duh, dash A, this will show me the MAC address to um, IP address table of all the different PCs I've talked to. So here's the ones that my PC has, has dealt with. But it only holds these for a short amount of time. I want to say it's 15 minutes, but I could be wrong. But So anybody I talk to, so let's say I talk to Google, I can ping www.google. So Google is 108.177, you get the idea. And then I can run ARP-A again. So now, why doesn't it show up? Who can tell me why it doesn't show up here? Remember what I told you, the, the MAC address information gets removed um, at each router and then new stuff is gets put on. So the only MAC address I'm going to see is my routers because when that traffic comes back to me, it's going to go from, let's say, you know, my ISP's router to my router. Then my router is going to change the addressing information, the MAC address stuff, um, to between my PC and the router. So you won't be able to see um, those MAC addresses, but if you do this internally, like in, in our classroom, I can ping one of the, the students and then I can actually see what his MAC address is because we're on we're not going through a router we're only going switch to switch but the big lesson here is ARP is address resolution protocol and it remembers the IP address to MAC address um, of anybody that you've talked to uh, or that you've communicated with now and this is why you we can't really track people by MAC address because once you hit a switch the switch removes the MAC address information and puts new MAC address on for the next for the local loop or the local segment all right moving on so remember, ARP only works on the same network. Like the, again, the, the router always removes that information when it comes back in. So again, just like this example, so when A sends to our, let's say um, this PC is sending here to the file server. If, if I looked at the packet right here on this segment, this would be the source MAC address and this would be the destination MAC address. But when that router gets it, he removes this information and puts new information on. So at this part of the journey, this would be the source MAC address and this would be the destination MAC address. And then when router 2 gets that information, he strips it off and he puts this MAC address as the source and this MAC address as the destination. So anything that this file server has, he's gonna be, it's gonna, always going to be from this uh, MAC address here, even though it could be coming from somewhere out in space or the internet or something like that. So that's why ARP only works on the local network. But it's still something to keep in mind. So let me give an example. Let's say um, I'm mad at HR for some reason, or for some reason I want to get into the an HR PC or uh, the CEO's PC. Let's say I searched the internet and I found a really cool hack that I can use. It's a hacking tool. And I need to know their MAC address. So now I need to get the CEO's MAC, or let's say HR. I need to get HR's MAC address. So what can I do? Well, in a business, where do we typically put the name of the computer? We typically put it on a sticker in front of that computer. So all I gotta do is walk into HR and ask them an HR question and note the name of the PC. Then I go back to my desk and I can do an NS lookup, which looks up the friendly name of that PC that I put in, and then it gives me the IP address. Then I can ping that PC because it's on my local network, and then its MAC address will be in my ARP cache. And then I can have its MAC address, I can do the hack, so kind of keep that stuff in mind. It all works together. All right, moving on. So again, they're just talking about ARP. And remember, ARP um, gives you two basic functions. It resolves an IP address to a MAC address, and it kind of maintains all those um, different PCs that you've talked to. 
And the reason for this is, like, let's say I talk to a file server that's on my network, and then five minutes later I need to go back. Well, instead of having to get that information again, um, it would just go back to your ARP table and then be able to IP all that information without having to do a broadcast. So that's the kind of the big benefit of ARP. So when a when an address is removed from the ARP cache and you're trying to get to a file server or something like that, you've got to send a broadcast because you don't know where it is, or you send it to your to the default gateway, which is the closest router. But if it's something that's in your ARP cache, you could just put all the addressing information and then send it out. So there would be no broadcast, because remember we talked about broadcasts are bad. All right, there's another video on their thing. You know, we kind of they just kind of like walk you through that um, um, an ARP request and then the ARP reply and talk about the role. All right, you can also remove entries in the ARP cache. And according to this, they're saying that the, um, the Windows operating system store the ARP cache for two minutes which seems kind of light to me. And I just Googled that real quick, and there, most people kind of seem to agree that with most Microsoft products that the ARP cache is stored for 10 minutes. But if you really kind of get into ARP um, a lot uh, and dig into it, you can actually put your own static entries in the ARP table, um, and then it never has to look up things. So like if you've got, um, obviously, local devices like your file server, your email server, uh, your content management server, whatever whatever it is your, your business is using, you can actually hard code those ARP entries in there so that they're always in there and they never kind of like remo get removed. And that way your PC, those PCs when they're going to those devices never have to send broadcasts. Alright, they show you some ARP tables and we kind of we showed you that. And then they talk about broadcasts. And this is something to remember, especially the second bullet point. ARP requests can flood the local segment if a large number of devices were to be powered up and all start accessing network services at the same time. So what happens is power goes out. And for some reason, you don't have battery backup in the, the server or the, one of the equipment closets and four switches all shut off and all the PCs shut off. Power comes back on, everything comes back on, but for the first 10 minutes, the network is slow. Maybe not even 10 minutes, maybe like, you know, five minutes. Because one, the switches have to relearn all the MAC addresses, so everything becomes broadcast, which slows things down. And then all the ARP caches are all blank, so that like all the PCs have to broadcast for everything that they're trying to get to. So that can cause a lot of issues. So just because power came back on, um, when all the users start calling in saying, hey, the network is slow, or hey, I can't get to this, just tell them, hey, hold on five minutes and let's try again. All right. Then they talk about ARP spoofing. And ARP spoofing is a very dangerous thing that you have to watch out for, especially with a man in the middle attack. So basically what I'll do is I'll convince your PC that I'm the router, and I'll convince the router that I'm you by poisoning your ARP tables. And then everything that you send to the router or out to the internet or the email server, whatever it is, would go through my PC, and then everything would, then it would, so from your point of view, nothing would change. You'd, you'd still be getting traffic in and out of your PC, but it would all be going through my PC as the middleman. And then I can rebuild those packets with different uh, third-party programs um, and do all kinds of weird stuff with it. So make sure you're careful about that. So if you buy the big expensive enterprise level switches, um, they have a, a mitigation technique known as dynamic ARP inspection um, that should hopefully prevent some of that. All right, and then that kind of wraps it up. So make sure you're good with all these different terms. Um, Jumbo and Baby Giant are kind of the same thing. That's a, a frame that's over 1,518. You know, a runt is smaller than 65 or 64 uh, bytes. Uh, collision, you know, when we have a collision, hexadecimal. Make sure you understand where the OUI is in a MAC address. It's the first six digits. And encapsulation is when we're putting information on the packet. Um, frame delimiting, you know, we have to make sure we watch the size. And there's always something in there like this cycle redundancy check um, to check to make sure the packet's not been corrupted. Uh, or it might be a frame check sequence. Preamble signals the start. Ether type kind of tells you, hey, this is the type of Ethernet we're going to be on. 802.2 .2 is the LLC layer. 802.3 is the Ethernet in general. All right, so make sure you're good with all these different terms. And that's about it. Yay, Cisco. All right, so let's talk about Packet Tracer this week. So this week in Packet Tracer, there's only two labs. None of them have any score. It's just finding your own kind of stuff. You know, hey, click this, click this, do this, look at this. Hey, look at this, good, nice. All right, so I'm going to go here, cancel that. 
So none of them score you. They all walk you through. Click this, ping this, enter this. So I'm not going to go through those. So there won't be any lab video this week. But you can see next week, um, there's several packet tracers uh, that we will. So we'll, we'll be, uh, we will start having labs um, starting next week. So that's it for this week. Have a good one.